From the Mecca of Mormonism, Salt Lake City, Utah, this is Heart of the Matter, where we are tonight having a trial, so to speak. Um, I have with me, kind of as a guest, kind of as an investigator, kind of as a journalist, uh, the lead of the, the founder of Check My Church, uh, Sarah Young. Thank you for being here with us. Thank Part you. of Check My Church's uh, description is to check out what's going on in churches, what they're about. And if you go to their website, you can see different churches and their assessment of them and their pastor, what their doctrines are, their practices, things like that. Well, with that investigative mind, Sarah, uh, we talked and we thought, you know what? It would be great for you because of recent charges that I am a heretic and an apostate and a cult leader and, and the most dangerous, the most vicious man you can imagine and all these different things that we thought, well, why doesn't Sarah step in with Church Check My Church vigor and kind of without any planning between us, hey, what are you going to say here? What are you going to do there? All I did is I sent her, hey, you might ask, um, we might go about asking questions in this order. I sent that to her. That's all it was. She never responded back. She has showed up here with her laptop and with me sitting on the witness stand and she is going to act as the Grand Inquisitor in Dostoevsky's uh, novel. And she's going to question me about teachings, beliefs. I think it's about teachings and beliefs. Practices, I don't know. We'll find out. I am now going to turn it over to her as if this is her gig. And then when she's done after about an hour, we'll stop this episode, take a break, and then we'll do the following weeks because I'm sure it's going to take us more than one. Sarah, it's all yours. Yeah, so what I want to do is just ask you about the facts, about what you believe, to get a clear overview of everything and what that means in relation to the Christian faith, because this is about really focusing on the accusations of apostasy and being a cult leader and heresy against you. So by the end of this series of interviews, um, people should be able to make an educated decision um, and discern for themselves as brothers and sisters in the body of Christ what they think about you, what they think about what you what you believe, but based on the truth and not you know little clips taken out of context in other videos. This is really going to be a, sort of like a statement of faith interview. Okay. Um, and the and the and the uh, I guess the general belief that I'm going to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Just giving you the benefit of the doubt that you're going to tell us what you believe. Okay. People can discern if they think you're being dishonest or not, but that's all we can do is ask questions. Right. So the first question then being is why don't you have a statement of faith on the Campus Church website? Because having one would really help people to go on the website and say, well, what does he really believe? But there's not one there, so people are kind of confused by that. Uh, okay, so to step back and to give you kind of a framed answer, um, I believe because of my eschatology that the faith is subjectively lived and understood today by the Holy Spirit writing, by God writing his laws on the hearts and minds of individuals. And so to put a statement of faith says for you to come here, you have to believe what we believe. And uh, I guess if we put a statement of faith, it could be if you, uh, if you believe in a Benedict, a Trinity, a modalist of this, you're welcome. If you believe in this, 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 and this, and this, you're welcome. Uh, or I could summarize it by just saying, however you're interpreting the scripture, Christ in your life, or even know God, you're welcome here. Why? Because, uh, and this is important, we teach what I think is right, but we don't make anybody agree with those teachings. We, we ask them to test those teachings and to uh, hear what I have to say. And so it's not about the statement of faith we want people to embrace. It's about us giving the opinion, us teaching the best of our ability, being challenged by that and letting them come to uh, their own ideas of what they're going to accept and what they're going to reject in terms of faith because people, I think, do that anyway. Right. Yeah, that's why we don't have the statement of faith. Would you consider just putting a statement on the website just explaining what you believe personally? and what you teach? It's a really good question, Sarah, because what I believe personally um, does not necessarily lend to the approach we take here. 
And so if I believe something, I'll say that this is what I believe, but uh, that's all it is because every pastor and teacher is going to have things they believe that they could be right or wrong on. Right. My thing is to say, this is what I'm teaching. And someone can say, I don't agree with that. And I'll say, that's fine. You got to figure it out for yourself. But for me to say, this is what I teach automatically would make people say, oh, it does several things. It would say, oh, I got to agree with everything he teaches. When the things I teach cannot be understood in a single statement, they have to be understood through an exegetical approach to the scripture. And so you have to test it over a period of time. And if it's just Sean believes this, it's a soundbite that, that throws people into, I like him, I don't like him. Right. Instead of letting me explain through the scripture what it is. So to put my beliefs on there is almost irrelevant because it doesn't matter what I believe when it comes to the application of our approach. Okay, yeah. I see. So then going back, just tell us more about your background in the LDS church, like your roadside experience, becoming a Christian, and then ultimately starting the Heart of the Matter show. Okay, I'll do it in a, in a really truncated, summarized form. Um, I was... My parents joined the LDS Church in East Los Angeles before I was born. I have five brothers and sisters. Um, I was born into the faith. I was raised in the faith. Um, I believed in the faith superficially. I didn't really know anything. I was rebellious. I loved two things in my life. Then I loved God. I knew I loved God and I loved sin. Those were my favorite things in life, God and sin. So obviously there's a problem, especially as a Mormon. Got okay. myself right, went on the mission, uh, came back, got married in the temple, and then I started to just question things. And I went down 17 years, and I was really at a low point. I got in a car, and I was driving to pick my daughters up, and I heard uh, Charles Stanley on the radio preach why I couldn't fix myself, even though I had tried through religion, and he gave the gospel message. And essentially, I was born again that day in a roadside experience. And I was a born-again Mormon, because I was still a Mormon. Right. And I experienced the rebirth from above. And I think that I really appreciate the question, because as of last week, someone says, You're n you never have known Christ. And that roadside experience changed my entire trajectory of life where I have now focused my entire everything on Christ. Right. And yet I am being told I've never known Christ. And, and, and I got to tell you, that really hurts. Yeah. So I was a born again Mormon. I wrote a book called Born Again Mormon, was invited to come on a TV show here in Utah because it's about Mormonism. I was invited, there was a big response. And so then they asked me if I wanted to do my own show. And I, of course, we had no money, we had no job. Our, our pets' heads were falling off. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I said yes, and so I started traveling up here with Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa uh, supporting me. I had gone through their school of ministry to learn the Bible. I went through the Bible twice, from Genesis to Revelation, answering questions, listening to Chuck Smith teach verse by verse in that two-year course study, plus the other work. So twice I had been through the Bible to prepare me for the show that I would do live here in Salt Lake City beginning in March of 2006. Okay. So that's what brought me here. Prior to even getting here, the pastors in the area were against my presence. They oh. didn't like the, the title Born Again Mormon. They went to the television station and said, do not have this guy. There was an automatic resistance to my very person from the moment before I even did show one. I didn't, even, I didn't know that, that yeah. they were against you before you even got uh, before here. Before I even got even here. Before they even met you. Before, they ever, you. before we did show one. Huh. Part of the reason was I wanted to call it the Born Again Mormon Hour. And they don't, they don't believe that you can be born again and be in the Mormon right. church. And because of that dogma, they said no, and they really fought it. And so the television station owner and manager said, look, you can't call it the Born Again Mormon Hour. So I came up with Heart of the Matter from the Don Henley song. Uh -huh. and, and what did people wind up calling the show when it was on TV? Aren't you that born again Mormon guy? So it, was, it, it should have been called that, but there was resistance from the beginning. Okay. Yeah. So Jason Wallace makes a big deal about the fact that by your own admission, you never attended any Christian churches except for maybe three or four yeah. um, during this time. And he sort of has a point because after you started Heart of the Matter and while you were doing it, why weren't you attending any Christian churches and how were you growing in your faith? And, and your maturity with Christ it's if a really you weren't good question. going to churches? It's a really good question. <laughs> so um, 
one, I had been through the Bible twice, which is what many Christians haven't. And I, and I, so I, an in-depth study. Two, we started our own Bible study here because I knew the Bible pretty good, but I didn't know religion. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to churches because I came from a church. I went through Calvary Chapel two years where I had to volunteer at that church, but not during their services. Okay. I, I volunteered uh, answering phones for people who would call in during the services, so I wasn't in the service. Okay. And I got to see what religion was about from both the LDS side and from the Calvary Chapel side. And I said, it doesn't offer me anything. So people would say, oh, wait, you're breaking the cardinal rule of, of the New Testament. you got to fellowship with people. And that's their point. They can have that point. My point is you don't put old, uh, new wine in old bottles. My point is uh, John the Baptist didn't attend a church. Right. My point is Paul wasn't attending a church. Right. I do, so these are my examples going on. I'm going to follow it. Not that I'm a Paul, not that I'm a John the Baptist, but why, why do I have to go to a church when I have a ministry? I'm reaching out these people for the good news of Jesus Christ. Why would I go to a church? So there were a few I did visit, the four or five, okay. uh, and actually sat. And every time I went, I was like, what the walk is going on? <laughs> this is not what I am reading the, the faith is about. Wait a minute. This guy has 300 people sitting here. You've got valets and ushers greeting you, asking you if you're part of this group or that. You have people in booths trying to sign you up to, to join certain things. You finally get in the service. There's a fog fricking machine and there's a guy praising Jesus. And then this, and then you have announcements on a screen of everything that should be going on. Finally, they start asking for money. And then after the money, you get the pastor get up there and he's wearing his Tommy Bahama shirt and he's looking cool. And he's like, hey, man, let's talk about Jesus. I was skiing the other day with my uh, with my son. And we were like, isn't Jesus great? And I'm like, I have nothing to do with these guys. That was religion playing to me. Phenopole. If I had gone to one of the churches and I heard the truth being preached without all the stuff, I probably would have continued to go. But in the four experience and the Calvary Chapel experience and then the Mormon experience, I'm like, no, no, no. I'm going to take my Bible like a plowboy and I'm going to learn as much as the Pope. So you were, though, you were studying the scriptures this whole time on your own, not, not in a church, but you were studying the scriptures. And you were, I mean, you had fellowship with your wife and your kids and the people close to you. And the people in the ministry. And the remember, people in the ministry. And we have guys I went to the school of ministry with who were Christians. Okay. Kevin Kennington, Marcus. We had different people around. Now, I didn't, I didn't submit to their authority because they didn't have any authority. But they were definitely involved in my life. And in terms of studying the scripture, man, I have been in that without anyone twisting my arm violently mm -hmm. for all these years and ever since we started the ministry. So that has never been something I needed the pastor to tell me about, you know, a ski trip to get me to read the scripture. Right, right. Okay. So then... Can you tell I get impassioned when we yeah, talk Yeah, you get a little excited. Yeah, too damn bad. Because, so because of uh, some other people, David, I cannot say his name. Yes. And Lee Baker leaving Mormonism becoming Christians, and then moving away from Protestant Christianity. James White and others have said that anyone coming out of Mormonism should wait like a certain number of years, like eight years eight or years. something, <laughs> of exposure to the Christian faith before teaching. Hmm. So what, what do you think about that? Well, I think one, James, my brother in Christ, would love to put a date and an amount of time on something because that's what we do when we want to make laws and rules. Mm -hmm. Two, I think of Tyndale who became a Christian and started translating the Bible within a, a short period of time. And it's where we got our English Bible from. So there was no vetting period going on for people. Three, I don't remember in scripture seeing any vetting going on with people who received Christ. They received him, they were had the miracle and they went out and started sharing. So yeah, this vetting is a man-made thing, which is what men do. And what James is really saying is we don't want people who are full of the spirit, saved by Christ, who, who have come out of Mormonism or anything else to get involved in ministry because they don't preach what we preach. So the eight years is a time for them to inculcate you. Right. So you'll teach what they teach. Yeah. You think it's more like a time frame so that they have time to yeah. work on people. Yeah. And get them to believe what they want them to believe. Right. 
Right. Okay. And the fact, uh, to, to bring this in, Baker and Dave Bartosowitz and me and anybody else, whatever their journey is, I trust if they are seekers of God, he's leading them. We don't have to worry. They want to say, well, wait a minute. They have gone off to this path. That is just against the orthodoxy of the faith. They're not called. Who are they to say that? How do they know what God is doing in their lives? So that's another reason why it really rubs me wrong when these guys will come out and say, if they've been Mormon, let's see. Okay, let's start the period now. Right. Eight years from now, we'll look in on, in on you again. So then this might be a silly question, but what is really the motivation behind your criticisms against the evangelical Christian churches, the Calvinists, the practices and teachings of other Christian denominations? Because their, their argument is that you're tearing down the church mm -hmm. and that you're being divisive and you're being contentious. But is that what you're trying to do is argue with people or are you, are you, is it about showing them to be wrong? What's really the, the heart of the matter, I guess, behind these passionate, you know, attacks? Yeah. See, North, North, North Coat Parkinson, he's a philosopher, and he said, uh, the amount of time that people spend on a subject is inversely related to the complexity of the subject. So if we have a very difficult subject, it's too hard for us to really articulate so we just pass it off with little statements and we just, and if it's something that's really easy to understand, like how many chairs should we put in the kitchen today? <laughs> then you'll spend all day talking about it, right? Because it makes you look smart. So when you ask a question like that, uh, the answer is so multifaceted that uh, you could take any segment from any show that I've done and make me look like I am a hypocrite. Because on one show I'll be saying, James, you're freaking out of your mind. <laughs> And on another show, I'll say, we need to love each other. We need to right. get along. So part of it, one, I have matured. In the older shows, even just a year, two years ago, I was much more aggressive. But I think the Holy Spirit has moved me more and more to actually try to love those who are uh, 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 not walking the walk the way I think they should. That's one. Okay. Two, I think the criticisms are value for people who are seekers. If someone's sitting in a church and they see the donation plate passed around with the word tithe three times in the service, I think it's good for them to hear someone say, this is wrong. And because I think we can improve in the faith and I think we're getting worse in the faith. The other reason is I absolutely detest very about five different elements of Christianity today. I detest uh, the culture because it's become a culture of Christianity. Uh, it's become, you know, not of this world shirts. It's become a look. Even this, you know, I'm starting to dread it because all the Calvinists are wearing that, wearing this. Yeah, that's the look. It's that's the, the look, look for yeah. the Calvies, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, I, and I, I detest some of the teachings. I detest the teaching of eternal punishment from a God who knew all things. I detest Calvinism for certain reasons, for its, uh, for its dogmatic positions on who God saves and who he doesn't. I detest a number of different things. So sometimes when I'm covering that subject, I'm going to be animated and detestful. So I'm going to say, hey, let's love each other. And so it gets mixed and people think the guy is either crazy or he's not being consistent. I'll tell you right now. And this is something maybe you're going to get to. You're going to get to doctrine and... Oh, and, yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that. Not I'll in this interview, up. but... Okay. Yeah. Right. We'll get into doctrine and Who everything. That? Okay. So the next question. Um, when you announced uh, back in like 2013, I think it was, that you were going to be criticizing the evangelical Christian churches, that wasn't you renouncing your faith. <laughs> in Christ or saying that you denounce the Christian faith or the Bible or any of your Christian beliefs because calling you an apostate seems to stem from this assumption that because you're attacking these things it's because you're not a Christian and that you've apostatized. Yeah, it's uh, so unfortunate. Uh, I guess that it can be some summarized as if you criticize the church, you're right. not a Christian. Right. And. Uh, and I felt that there was a great need for criticism. And after what I saw, I mean, Sarah, we're bringing out literally hundreds of people from Mormonism, if not thousands, because of the show over a seven year period. And they're going into churches and they're going into more bondage. And everyone's heard me say this before, that's not right. And, and you know, with God as my witness, I'll die and say, God, that's not right. 
And if I'm wrong, let him beat me with a few stripes. But I believe I'm right. I have to be passionate about what I believe. How can they prey upon people in the name of God so that they can fill their pockets and run their program? It's not right. Now, if you can prove to me that something I'm teaching is, is wrong or incorrect, say, but they can't. All they can do is call me and label me an apostate, a heretic, a cult leader. Right. Right. These, just these words that right. kind of people throw out. Now, now our brothers have gotten a little bit more specific of late with uh, uh, Trinity and a few things, but we can talk about that when you yeah, bring it up. Yeah, we will. And so Jeff Durbin, Jason Wallace, and others, they've used this criticism for you from you towards local churches and your unorthodox doctrines to call you an apostate. But an apostate is someone that outright renounces their faith in Christ and walks away from him. Um, but you've never done that, right? You've never renounced your faith in Christ and then say you come back or anything like that. Uh, since the roadside experience in 97, come hell and high water, my own failures in the flesh, anger amongst men, uh, anything else that my flesh is capable of, which is a lot. Uh, never, ever, ever, ever have renounced Christ Jesus, Lord and Savior, the way, the truth, the life, the only way to the Father, salvation by grace through faith in Him alone and nothing else. Never, ever, ever. I preach Christ. I teach Christ. I, we preach the Bible. Never, ever. And that's not enough for these guys. Well, that's the definition of apostasy. So if they're calling you an apostate, then obviously that doesn't apply here. Good to know. So then the question becomes, what do you believe? Does it line up with Christianity? Does it align with the core essentials of the faith? But before we ask that question, I just want to ask this, is do you believe there are essential doctrines that draw a line or a border that, that say this is Christianity and this is not? It's a great question and it's a tough one to answer. Especially, so I got to be honest, this is what gets me into trouble. Is that a question like that is going to get me into trouble? All right. When Jesus walked the earth and he chose his 12 apostles to go to the house of Israel, yes. When Paul was preaching to the people then, yes. These were the tenets of the faith. Jesus came, he lived, he died. But we also read in at least seven passages where Jesus came and paid for the sins of the world, cosmos, it's for believer, uh, I mean, for all the world, especially those who believe. Okay. So when we know that he paid for the sins of the world, especially those who believe, then I have to answer that question a little bit differently than the standard. Okay. And what I say is I believe Jesus has had the victory over sin and death for the world. Whether you believe in him or not is irrelevant. You're a beneficiary of that Christian act by Christ. Now, do, uh, do uh, you have to receive Christ by faith to have access to the Father? By all means. Is that what makes you a Christian? By all means. By all means. But do you benefit from things Christ has done in the Christian way? You do without faith. So because that is, is teased apart in my mind in Scripture, I can't just say, you have to say Jesus and you believe in him in order to benefit. I don't believe that. I think God has done enough for us to have um, uh, salvation from sin, um, but not salvation to his kingdom. Right. That comes by faith alone in Christ. Okay. So do I ever judge anybody? Here's the, the next line. Maybe you're getting to that or if you are. But uh, will I say to somebody, you're not a Christian because you don't believe in the Jesus I believe in? Never, right. never. And that's what makes me a little bit more liberal to people too. Okay. But you do believe though that there are things that makes someone a Christian. Absolutely, like for, faith on his son. Because I mean, for however many years it was, seven, eight years, you were differentiating between Mormonism yes, and I did. Christianity. I did. So you do say that there is a line that once you cross it, that's not Christian biblical Absolutely. doctrine. If someone said to me, I, I uh, believe in Jesus was a good teacher, but I don't believe in the resurrection and I don't believe that he's paid for the sins of the world on the cross. And if they said, are you, uh, do you think I'm a Christian? I'd say no. Yeah, you know, not a Christian. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So next we want to walk through then what you believe. And if those beliefs line up with what most Christians, I guess, would say the essentials of the faith. Um, regardless of whether you believe there are core essentials, but you do, there's core essentials. That doesn't mean you don't believe in the doctrines that, 
I mean, that doesn't believe you don't believe in the doctrines that other Christians don't consider to be the essentials of the faith. Right. Can, so, do you, are you going to ask me what the, or do you have the essentials? We're going to, yeah, we're going to okay. walk through and establish what those essentials okay. are. Okay. And then we're going to see where you line up with Got all it. of those. Okay. But that's where I'd like to end this first part is just establishing you're not apostate. You've never renounced your faith in Christ. Okay. You have been born again. Okay. Just the background. But then next we'll walk through uh, the essentials, okay. I guess, and then establish if you line up with those. All right. But that's it for this round. Okay. Round one is over. How long did we go, Seth? That's a oh, short man. show. That but that's okay. <laughs> uh, will the next one take us over an hour? The rest will be, be much longer. But... Okay. Let's make this long show a little bit shorter, 25 minutes. It's a good introduction. I just want to emphasize something to you. Uh, we did not collude. I have no idea what she's going to ask me. I, don't, I have no idea what approach she's going to take. Uh, if we can't be open, transparent, and say what we believe as believers, then I don't think uh, you're really walking the faith, you know. We, I got, we got to be honest with each other. So just know that because the, the criticism is going to be is, uh, first of all, they're going to say, Campus uh, Sean started this with her. That's not true. She started Check My Church on her own. Two, that I have a say in what she does and believes. Not at all. Three, that I put her up to this and we colluded. Not at all. So you can think we're liars, you can think I'm a liar, or you can take us at face value and know this is impromptu and we're trying to get to the heart of the matter. See you next week.